So homework 32 starts chapter 4, which is on exponential and logarithmic functions. They threw this one in here in kind of a weird spot because it's over where chapter 1 stuff on your pie chart would be. But the reason they put it in here is because you'll be doing compound interest and continuous interest and all of that good stuff. So they threw it in in chapter 4. So hopefully this one's really easy. Finding simple interest. My formula is that interest equals my principal times my rate times my time. My rate, obviously, I'd change to a decimal. My time has to be the time in years, which these ones will be. So my principal here, he deposited $500 into an account that pays simple interest at a rate of 6%, so 0 0.06, and he wants to know how much interest he'd be paid in the first five years, so for five years. So basically, you're just going to multiply 500 times 6% times 5. It says without a calculator, but you can use your calculator if you want. 150. $150 interest then. A dual deposit, $6,000 in an account that pays simple interest at a rate of 4% per year. How much will it be paid in the first four years? So, 6,000 is principal. His interest rate is 4%. The time is four years, and if you multiply that out, you'd have $960 in interest. So on the third one, in order to find the interest, what are you going to punch into your calculator? Unless you want to do it in your head. <laughs> Eight hundred times point zero five times three years is one twenty. So it's in there in kind of a weird spot, and then we'll talk about interest later on. And now we'll go to something totally different. <laughs> we already had. I better pause my video. We already had the vertical line test. This time we're going to do the horizontal line test. It says, for each function graph below, state whether it is one-to-one -one or not. Technically, you should be doing both the vertical line test and the horizontal line test to see if it's a one-to-one -one function. A one-to-one -one function means that for every x value, there's one corresponding y value, and for every y value, there's one corresponding x value. On Alex, Everything is going to pass the vertical line test, so, I mean, you can check them, but it'll pass. <laughs> so we're just going to check the horizontal line test. So if I draw a horizontal line that touches more than once, it is not going to be one-to-one. -one. So this next one again, if I drew my horizontal line, if I could draw it up there, it would hit those two points, not going to be one-to-one. -one. Same thing here, if I draw it right there, it's going to touch two times. Not going to be one-to-one. -one. Ah, here we finally got one that's one-to-one. -one. If I drew a vertical line, it touches once. If I draw a horizontal line, it touches once. Yes, that is a one-to-one -one function. So the second, or the fourth and fifth one, or fourth and fifth, fifth and sixth ones here. This one here, if I draw my horizontal line, definitely touches way too many times, not a one-to-one -one function. This one, we're okay here. Looks like we're okay all the way through. So that last one will be a one-to-one -one function. Number five then. Is the first one one-to-one? -one? Yes. yes, it is. The second one. No. Nope. I drew my line up there, it's twice. The third one. Yes. That one looks okay. The fourth one. No. Nope, I hit it a bunch of times. The fifth one. Yes. Yep, that one's okay. And the last one. No. No, if I drew it right up there, I hit twice. Number 
number six. The first one? No. No. Second one? No. No. The third one? No. No. Nope. Everyone, I want to hit a bunch. The fourth one? No. no. The fifth one? Yeah. That one looks okay. I don't have any lines I could draw that would hit more than once. So yes, and the last one. Yes. That one is also a yes. Just touches once. So just watch out for that one if you're doing something other than Alex. Technically, when it asks if it's one-to-one, -one, you should test both vertical and horizontal. The next three are talking about inverse functions. An inverse function is when you switch the x and the y around. Notation for an inverse function, they'll say to the negative one power. So the inverse of g would be the set, and I'm just going to switch my ordered pairs around. So negative 2, negative 9, 7, negative 2, negative 4, 2, and 6, 4 would be my inverse function. So this first question is saying, in my inverse function, find my ordered pair that has an x value of negative 2, what is the corresponding y value? So, this would be the point here that has an x value of negative 2. The corresponding y value is going to be negative 9. Now, the second part of this, we have h of x equals 4x minus 3. It's written in functional notation. If I write it in regular form, I would write it as y equals 4x minus 3. To do the inverse of the function, I switch the x and the y around. So x is going to equal 4y minus 3, and then I go ahead and solve that for y. So x plus 3 equals 4y. I'm just going to make one big fraction. So x plus 3 over 4 is what my inverse function is. Now the last part of this wants us to put 1 into our inverse function, and then once I do that, put that into the regular function. So I'm going to put the 1 into my inverse function. And so 1 plus 3 is 4. I get 4 over 4, which happens to be 1. I'm then going to take that answer, put it into my regular function. So I'm going to do 4 times 1 minus 3. 4 times 1 is 4. 4 minus 3, hey, is 1. My answer there is 1. Now, since the regular function and the inverse function are opposites of each other, if this is 1, this also better end up being 1, or there's a mistake somewhere in there. The middle number might not be 1, but if this is 1, the final number should be 1, if everything's working out correctly. Let's see, number 8 then. So number 8, if I'm first of all going to do my inverse function, my new set of ordered pairs would be what? 3, 2, 3, 4, 1, negative 1, 6, and 1, negative 4, and 6. So, it's saying, in my inverse function, if I have an x value of 6, what's my corresponding y value? 1. one. There would be my point that has an x value of 6. Corresponding y value is 1. Then we want to find the inverse of our function. I'm going to write it as y equals, that's probably the car sells me guy. Oh, x is Okay, I, I can almost read my own writing. y equals 2x plus 13. So if I'm going to do the inverse of my function, I'm going to switch my x and my y. So x equals 2y plus 13. 
If I'm going to solve that, I would do what? Subtract my 13 and divide by my 2, right? So x minus 13 over 2. Now this one, if I'm working it out correctly, I'm going to put the negative 5 into the h function first, right? I always go in the closest one first. So I'm going to put it up there. 2 times negative 5 plus 13 would give me negative 10 plus 13, which is 3. I'm then going to take that and put it into my inverse function. So 3 minus 13 over 2. 3 minus 13 is negative 10. Negative 10 over 2, hey, guess what? Is negative 5. If I got anything other than negative 5, there's a mistake somewhere in my problem. Number nine here, doing the inverse of G would be what for my ordered pairs? So, in my inverse function, if I have an x value of negative 2, what is my corresponding y value? Negative 4. Negative four. The second part, we're going to do the inverse. So, we're going to say y equals 9x minus 4 over 3. And in order to do the inverse, we're going to switch our x and our y. So, we're going to have what? I equals 9 x equals, x equals 9y, 9y minus, 4 minus 4 over 3, right? Switch your x and your y. Now if I'm going to solve that for y, first thing I would do is times by 3, so 3x equals 9y minus 4, and then I would Add 4, so 3x plus 4 equals 9y. And lastly, divide by our 9, right? So 3x plus 4 over 9 is my inverse function. So I'm going to start by putting 5 into my inverse function. 3 times 5 plus 4 over 9. If I do that, I'm going to get... Nineteen over nine, right? <laughs> you guys are taking a nap after lunch. Nineteen ninths. So I'm then going to take that, put it into my h function. So nine times nineteen ninths minus four over three. When I do nine times nineteen ninths, the nines will cancel out. Nineteen minus four is fifteen, and fifteen thirds. Guess what? Gives me the five that you already knew it was going to be. It's a good way to double check to make sure it comes out right. All right, so inverse function problem type 2. I like to switch my x and my y right away at the beginning. For some reason on this one, the Alex explanation solves it for x and then switches the x and the y at the end. Either way works. <laughs> but I would say, okay, y equals negative 4x plus 9 over 7 plus 3x. So for my inverse function, x is going to equal negative 4y plus 9 over 7 plus 3y. Change your y to x and your x is to y. Then I have to go ahead and solve that for y. So first of all, I have to get rid of my fraction. 
So I'm going to multiply by 7 plus 3y. So I'm going to get 7x plus 3xy equals negative 4y plus 9. I multiply there by my denominator. Since I want to solve it for y, I want my y's on one side. I'm going to move them to the left. Anything without a y on the other side. So I'm going to leave the 3xy. I'm going to add the 4y to move it over. I'm going to leave the 9 and I'm going to subtract the 7x to move that over. So anything with a y on one side, anything without a y on the other side, so that I can go ahead and factor the y out of those two terms. So y times 3x plus 4 equals 9 minus 7x. So just taking the y out of each of those. And then to solve it for y, all I have to do is divide. So my inverse function is equal to 9 minus 7x over 3x plus 4. That's only part of my problem because that's the first part, find the inverse of f. Then give the domain and the range. The domain. The domain, the bottom of my fraction can't equal 0. So 3x plus 4 can't equal 0. I'm going to minus my 4 and divide by my 3. If you really need to do it in two steps, go ahead, but I think you're good enough you don't really need to. In interval notation, so in interval notation, this is one of those where this is the hole in the middle, so we go from negative infinity to negative 4 thirds, not including that number, and then we go from negative 4 thirds, again not including that number, to positive infinity. There's my domain. The range of my inverse function happens to be the domain of my original function. So on the range, I'm using the denominator of the original function. What am I doing? Not x. <laughs> I'm doing 7, oops, 7 plus 3x cannot equal 0. I was going to solve it already. So x cannot equal negative 7 thirds then, right? Subtract my 7 and divide by my 3. So for my range, it's going to look like my domain, only I'm just going to change this number. I'm lazy. I highlight it, copy and paste. <laughs> so my range is going from negative infinity to negative 7 thirds, and then from negative 7 thirds to positive infinity. So all of those things will go in for your answers. Number 11 then, same kind of thing. Here's my function in regular notation. I'm going to replace the functional notation with a y, and then I'm going to do the inverse. So the inverse would be what? negative 2y over negative 8 plus y. Solving that for y, getting rid of our fraction, we're going to multiply by our negative 8 plus y, and then we would have what? y is on one side, my x is on the other, so I would go ahead and move my y's to the left and my other things to the right, or whichever order you really wanted to move them, 
I just don't like all those negatives. <laughs> so xy plus 2y would equal 8x, right? If you had all negatives on there, it would be the same thing. Factoring my y out, y times x plus 2 equals 8x. And then, of course, I can divide. So my inverse function is equal to 8x over x plus 2. So the domain, the domain of my inverse function is negative 2. I can't have a negative 2. So I'm going to go from negative infinity to negative 2, and then from negative 2 to positive infinity, right? The x plus 2 can't equal 0, so I can't have negative 2. The range of my inverse function, which is the domain of my original function, would be 8, eight right? Negative 8 plus x can't equal 0, so it's a positive 8 that we can't have. So negative infinity to 8, and 8 to positive infinity. when you find your range. And number 12, then. If I replace my f of x with the y and do the inverse, I would have what? x equals negative 4y plus 9 over 9y minus 8. Next step, we'll get rid of our fraction. And we would have equals our negative 4y plus 9, right? Moving our y's to the left and our other stuff to the right, we would then have what? Eight x plus nine. That would become a positive eight x when we move it over. Factoring out our y. y times 9x plus 4 equals 8x plus 9, and then divide. So our inverse function is 8x plus 9 over 9x plus 4. The domain of your inverse function would be negative four ninths is what I can't have. So negative infinity to negative four ninths and then negative four ninths to positive infinity. The range of my inverse function would be eight ninths, positive eight ninths using the denominator of our original function. So negative infinity to 8 ninths, and then 8 ninths to positive infinity. So kind of long ones. Graphing an exponential function these ones don't have any horizontal and vertical shifts, so we know that zero is going to be in the middle. So just like on those other ones, they're going to have you do negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. 
and we're just going to plug those in and solve, find our answers. So, if we do 3 fourths to the negative 2 power, what is that going to be equal to? 16 over, 9. 16 over 9, because the negative exponent, we have to do the reciprocal and then square it. So 16 ninths. 3 fourths to the negative 1 power would be? Four thirds, the reciprocal of three fourths is four thirds. Three fourths to the zero power. One. Anything to the zero power is one. Three fourths to the first power. Okay, since it's to the first power, it's the same thing. Three fourths to the second power. 9 sixteenths. So obviously on this one we have a whole bunch of fraction things. They're going to make you use that plot point tool. We're just going to estimate where they're at. Let's see, 16 ninths would be oh, somewhere underneath the two anyway. <laughs> Four thirds would be one and a third, so a little bit above the one. Zero one would be right there. One and three fourths and 2 and 9 sixteenths. Now they are going to make you do one other thing on here because what's going to happen with my exponential function is it's going to start up here, it's going to come down, and then it's going to level off and you're going to have what's called a horizontal asymptote. Asymptote is an imaginary line that the graph is approaching but isn't going to cross. So you will have a little tool that looks something like this up there on the top or on the side. You're going to click on that your horizontal asymptote is right on the x-axis. For an exponential function that doesn't have a vertical shift, it's always going to be right on the x-axis. So you just put that on there. Then when you hit the graph button, if I could draw straight, it looks something sort of like that. It's not really going to hit the x-axis, but I didn't draw very nice. <laughs> So number 14, again I'm graphing my exponential function, it doesn't have any shifts, so they're going to use those five values to plug in for your x. So I'm going to do one half to the minus a negative two power. Which would give me? Which, what did you get? No? No. One-fourth? One-fourth, yep. Because the minus and negative make that a positive two. One-half to the second power. One-fourth. One-half to the minus negative one power would be? One-half. One-half to the minus our zero power, which won't make any difference. <laughs> one-half to the zero power is? One. Anything to the zero power is one. One half to the minus one power then is going to be two. The reciprocal of one half is two over one. And one half to the minus two power would be four. The reciprocal would be two and two squared is four. So negative two is up a fourth. Negative 1 is up a half, 0 is at 1, 1 is at 2, and 2 is at 4. And again, my asymptote is going to go right along that x-axis so that when you hit the graph button, it'll look something sort of like that. exponential functions before? No? Something new? Hey, you finally got to do something new. <laughs> so we're going to do negative 2 to the negative 2 power. 
Notice there are not parentheses, so you're doing the 2 to the negative 2 power and putting the negative in front of that, right? So 2 to the negative 2 power is 1, one, one, I mean one, fourth. one fourth, and then I have the negative sign in front, so negative 1 fourth would be my answer. Of course, if you're really bad, you could use your calculator and punch this stuff in, but, you know, it's good practice. <laughs> negative 2 to the negative 1 power then would give me an answer of? Negative one half. Negative two to the zero power would be. What? What did you get? One. Negative. negative one. So we got that negative in front. Negative two to the first power is going to be. Negative two. Negative two. Minus two to the second power will give me. This is 4, then I gotta apply the negative to it. So negative 4. So the difference between this and this, right? Gotta do the exponent first before I do technically multiplying by negative 1. So negative 2 is at negative 1 fourth. Negative 1 is at negative 1 half. 0 is at negative 1. 1 is at negative 2, and 2 is at negative, whoops, 4. I better put that in the right spot. Again, I have my horizontal asymptote, and so I'm going to go like this. And my graph's going to look something sort of like that. And 16, 17, and 18, we're translating the graph of a logarithmic or exponential function. In fact, first we're going to do exponential ones, and later when we get into logarithms, we'll do logarithmic ones. But the translation is just like the translation when we did absolute values and square roots and all of those. The number with the x is going to go in the opposite direction, so this is going to shift it 1 to the left. The number on the end shifts it up or down, so down 1. So again, this is one of those where you grab that tool, the way you have to pull it over to the left one and down one. We drop it right there, and the graph would redraw where you drop your point. Mm So on number 17, how is that graph going to shift? To the right one and down three, right? The right and down. So we grab this point, we move it to the right one and down one, two, three, drops it right there, and the computer draws the graph through that point. to move the board all the way back to the top. <laughs> but on the last one, that one is going to move it up three and which way over? To the left four. So one, two, three, four, and up, whoops, one, two, three, four, and up one, two, three. Looks like it'd be at negative four, positive four. And then look something sort of like that. All right. So when you're looking for 